okay, it's a great pleasure for me to be here in Heidelberg next to Darmstadt where we are located and um, a quick train ride and be one of the speakers of the first in-person in event here. Um, and um, as you said, I'll try to show you some uh, patterns and techniques we used for continuous discovery uh, using a concrete example. Um, three or four facts about me. You said something about me, but I have uh, been in product for a few years and I have been uh, in software and product development for more than a few years. I think uh, now it's 15 or 20 years developing software, developing uh, products. And as far as my notes are concerned, I'm doing product for at least 10 years. Um, one of the saddest moments in my product career was in a engagement at a bank and one of my teammates, a developer, uh, was being asked, do you know what this product is for? Yes, 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 yes. Cool, you have been developing it for six months, so you should know what... Hey, yeah, that's no problem. We retrieve data fields from A, enrich them with things from B, and send them to C. Okay, understood, but um, what's the product for? Which problem is being solved by the product? I have no idea. And that was one of my saddest moments in product management, at my, one of my first gigs as product owner for a team and um, the guys, the folks in the team did not know what the product is for and that was a very sad moment. And I try to make it better now. Um, I'm CTO and found co-founder of Cozy. What is our business? And uh, that's no, um, ad block, that's something like you have to, uh, I think it's better to have that context to understand what I'm speaking about later. Um, we are not just yet another IT provider or IT supplier, we build products together with our customers, our clients. Uh, we have two groups of clients. The first group is, uh, and the example will be from that first group, are um, firms, companies, people, founders, or something similar, similar that try to build a product, a very tacky product, for example, and don't have any idea how to build products, especially tech products. One of my uh, favorite example is a um, cargo bike sharing company in Darmstadt. Um, I think the founders are no techies and they uh, had a great idea of sharing these cargo bikes, but uh, sharing these cargo bikes, that product is highly influenced by tech. That means you have to be um, tech focused or have to have a partner for doing such uh, or building such a product. The second um, group of um, customers is not relevant for this talk. That are grown ups, are uh, small and medium enterprises scaling their product organization and using um, teams, renting teams from us to scale their product organization. The example I want to talk about today is about a fair called Spiel. It's the biggest board game and card game fair in the world. Um, and it's a, an interesting topic. How are we getting in touch with a board game fair, a digital board game fair? The interesting thing is my um, co-founder, our CEO, is a big board game addicted. He always visited, he had been visiting this uh, fair for years, uh, taking holidays, paid uh, holidays to visit this fair and try new board games and, and so on. And in 2020, he listened to a podcast and heard, hey, there will be no in-person event this year. We can't imagine having an in-person event. Uh, we are uh, discussing and um, wondering about having a virtual, a digital um, event in 2020. The date will be the same at the end of October, but um, everything, the rest was unclear. And after listening to this podcast, we, we connected the organizers and asked, hey, is there an RFP? Are we allowed to attend? Yes, yes, please. And we won this um, RFP and now there was this big task of building a virtual fair for board games. And in normal years, this fair takes place at Messe Essen in Nordrhein-Westfalen, in, in the middle west of Germany. And um, 
has um, visitors around 200,000 uh, people for four days long. And it's a very packed atmosphere, playing people playing that board games, other people staying around watching them playing board games. It's some kind of uh, um, very packed atmosphere and the organizers said we could never imagine have, having such a packed in-person event in 2020. Nobody will know what, what will be the situation in October. Um, there will be no in-person event. Um, and the biggest challenge um, was to create an atmosphere for this community. These are people that love to play board games in their free time. These are people that decide, uh, explicitly decide not to use digital devices during that time. There are people that love to play board games, as, uh, board games and computer games, um, both of them. But when playing board games, the mo um, one of the most important things is the physical experience. Sitting around a table, having discussions, seeing the other people, you know, poker, seeing the others, uh, um, where's a bluff and so on. Seeing the other people around the table, playing, having cool touchy materials in that games, cool uh, games. And this community loves physical products and decides, explicitly decides to spend their time, a part of their time, using that physical products. Some of them actually spend, as I said before, like our CEO spent two, uh, two uh, days of their paid vacation to visit the four days of this fair, the whole four days, and not to miss just one day. And our challenge now was to create a cool digital experience for a very physical community. And to make it even harder with, within around four months. I said the decision has been, uh, had been made in around May 2020 and the date for the fair was in uh, October, end of October. And it was clear to us that creating that um, experience for a physical community meant doing both discovery and delivery work uh, at once and not starting with some kind of pre-planning and analysis and design and so on. Uh, just doing discovery and, uh, and delivery on a regular basis. Um, because there was no backlog for this fair. Nobody has ever built a thing like that. There was no backlog just to define, do, 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 do this, do that, and you have, you'll have a cool fair. A wish list, a client wish list was part of the RFP, sure. But I think if we just had implemented that wish list, we would uh, have got something like a very cool um, fair, trade fair catalog uh, within, uh, in the internet, on the internet, but not anything uh, interactive. Just to define those two terms, I, I don't know if you are all familiar with discovery and delivery and separation of them. Um, discovery is deciding what to build or People say something like building the right thing and delivery is building the thing right or building, just building it. That's um, from, um, I think that's uh, stolen from Melissa Perry, isn't it? No, from um, Teresa Torres, but she has stolen it from Marty Kagan. <laughs> Inspired by him, haha. <laughs> His book is just called Inspired. Um, and the interesting thing is we just, we, we had been using Scrum for years and building products using Scrum, but the interesting thing is in the upper left corner of that Scrum process. Yeah, there, yes, I know there are uh, German terms in it. I forgot to switch them. Um, we uh, added something like a product vision. Now there in the Scrum Guide, there's something like a product goal. We added something like a product vision uh, years ago, but in most of the Scrum teams, the backlog items appear like 
created by a miracle? Where are, they, where are all the backlog items coming from? Um, and we had the same situation. Our developers, when we started building that thing or thinking that thing, just asked us, hey, product owner, we need just user stories. We have to start. We have to know what to implement. Yeah, that's a cool idea, but we don't have any user stories. And don't ask the customer, the client, they can, can't answer the question uh, what good user sh stories should look like. That means in the first place we had just to clarify what is the product all about? What will be the, the heart of the product, the nature of the product? And related to that, what will be its success factors? Um, when will a digital fairground for board games be um, successful? And inspired by Marty Kagan, um, we um, tried to uh, align to these four risks. The first one is value risk. Um, that means, is your product being used? Is it uh, useful? Is it uh, valuable for customers? Do exhibitors at a digital fairground, are they willing to pay for booths? Are they seeing, oh, that's, there's value in having a virtual booth at a virtual fair? Is that interesting? And um, in context of this digital fair, do gamers visit the fair? Are they interested in visiting digital the digital fairground, seeing digital booths, playing digital copies of board games and so on? The second one is usability risk. Um, the fact that customers, clients, users want to use our product does not mean they are able to use it. Uh, there's a sad story in Jobs to be done, um, how big the percentage is of electronic devices being sent back by, the, by, the buyer, by buyers because they are not able to actually handle it. Electronic devices. I don't know if uh, DVD players or something like that is just, uh, are the, just a thing, um, but are they able to handle it? And you have to take into account usability risk means we have a, a, a very physical community and these exhibitors, some, uh, t uh, a part of them are handcrafters. That means that's their part-time job to create board games and handcraft board games. They have never heard of things like Discord, YouTube, creating YouTube videos, uh, creating and stuffing a virtual fairground booth and so on. Um, and we had to keep in mind that this, uh, this um, community must be able to use our product and not just to value it and uh, also to use it. The third risk is the feasibility risk. Are we able to build that thing? And uh, to be honest, today in tech, there's nothing that can't be built if time and budget are ir irrelevant. But time was very relevant in that case, around four months of uh, creating, designing and building that, that product. Um, and we had um, budget was a restriction too. The fourth risk is business viability risk. Uh, does it work for the business? Does it work for our clients? Um, that's great because um, we were not able to um, to foster um, avoid, avoiding that risk directly. We could consult our customer, hey, how is your digital business model? What will be the price for digital booth and so on? But in the end, they have to decide and to build things um, to be successful. And that is uh, a tool we use normally at the start. It's uh, inspired by um, Roman Pichler's product vision canvas. It's in German and the things are, you have target groups, you have um, the needs and problems of the target groups, you have the top features of your product. And that's the risks about uh, value. Is, does it provide value? Geschäftsmodell or business value is something like, does it work? Uh, business viability, does it work for you? And um, 
that covers some of the risks in the beginning. We've, we populated um, the product vision. You might say, hey, Constantine, we are not able to, to read that. Yes, yes, that's intended. There are some um, business secrets in there. And, um, but I'll show you some of the details later on. And the, 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 the most, um, the hardest thing in filling or populating a product vision together with clients is getting to them to operate in problem mode, not in solution mode. There's just one field for solution mode. Imagine how would the top features like, look like. And most of our clients in the beginning tend to, hey, we need these and that feature and the product must, uh, must look like that and so on and so on. And the problem is, hey, that are all solutions you think might work and we have seen all that risks. Um, so getting the customer to operate in the, in, the solu in, the, in the problem mode is the hardest part of filling a product vision. I um, said I will zoom in and we'll uh, have a look at the target group or the target groups. Um, we had gamers that are intensive gamers that use four days and come with trolleys to buy as much uh, <coughs> board games as they can carry. And on the other hand, we have big, uh, big ex uh, exhibitors, <coughs> small exhibitors, uh, families, guys like me that like to pay uh, board games on an occasional basis but are not willing to spend two days of uh, uh, paid holidays to visit a board game fair. Um, media partners, authors that are creating board games, illustrators that are make, making board games that are looking that cool as they are, traders, um, and that was too fast. Things were hard to, to define and build a product in these uh, short period of time. But if you look at that uh, slide, you can see we have some kind of platform product. That means if you optimize too much for exhibitors, the gamers or the visitors would say, visitors would say, I won't attend that. That's just a marketing gig. They are just uh, trying to get our email addresses. I don't have, um, I don't want to attend that. And if you optimize too much for gamers, all the exhibitors would say, hey, people, I want my money back. Uh, that's not cool, that's not working, that's not viable. The, the, all visitors are just nameless ghosts and I can't, uh, I'm not able to connect to them. So we started with discovery phase, and, but that was just the starting point, not, hey, we define, now define the product in the beginning and afterwards we just build it. Um, the, this phase was um, the starting point as well for um, the sales program of our client. They have to connect, connect to contact their exhibitors from the years before and tell them, hey, there will be a virtual fair, that will be the pricing model, we will, uh, you will be able to do that and that and that. And we have to define um, in a enough specific way what they'll get for pay their, their money if they will attend that or sponsor or whatever, but not with too much details because maybe you will um, offer them something you are not able to buy afterwards, uh, able to build afterwards. And so we started our disc uh, continuous discovery process um, from my point of view, continuous discovery is like this in the uh, Wild West uh, in America when they built the railway um, lines. Um, the people just planning the railway lines and deciding where tunnels and bridges and so on um, should be are just 200 meters, are inside of the people actually laying the tracks and not, hey, we'll, we'll make a plan and afterwards the people will come and lay, the, lay down the tracks. 
What patterns helped us doing continuous discovery? The first is goal-oriented milestones. Maybe some of you are developers, and developers traditionally hate milestones. Uh, because milestones are often misused, but milestones can be your friend. Um, this term of goal-oriented milestones is co uh, um, coined by, um, by Roman Pichler. What do I mean by that? In the mid of June, we had the starting point of our, um, of our engagement. And these goal-oriented milestones are not feature-based, they are capability-based. What should customers, exhibitors, visitors be able to do to achieve which jobs sh or should they be able to uh, um, execute at a, a given point in time. And that are all back calculations from the actual trading fair date. If on the end of October it should be possible to do X, Y, Z, at the beginning of August, for example, exhibitors start, have to start stuffing their booths because they, maybe they have um, to uh, create media for that, pictures for that, and so on. And this is um, the target group that is, um, has the farthest distance to digital natives in uh, our complete metrics. That means they have to get familiar with our platform uh, populating a, a virtual booth. Um, and we had to ensure that we can gather feedback from them. The next milestone was uh, a launch of video and event program. That means the uh, organizers and exhibitors and, uh, and media creators had to have a rough picture of what, be, what would be uh, on at this um, trade fair, what would be the program, uh, is there enough buzz, uh, is the organizer, has the organizer to smoothly force some of the exhibitors and media creators to create more buzz to have a cool um, trade fair. In an October, on the beginning of October, something like a, a, a soft launch that visitors uh, are able to plan their, their stay at the virtual fair and biz people are able to schedule meetings in their virtu virtual um, business meeting areas. Our client communicated all that by social media, hey, now it's on, uh, to um, ensure a good on onboarding experience for the community. Hey, it's there, test it, you can use it like that. And that was a very, very powerful tool to foster and um, initiate user onboardings. We used um, user story maps. Some of you may know that from Jeff Patton, user story maps. And these were our goal-oriented milestones. Um, or, and uh, we also had a very clear, clear customer or user journey, populating the booths and so on and so on. Um, the user story map was mainly populated uh, on a line from the upper left to the lower right side because our um, goal-oriented milestones were at first focusing on mainly on exhibitors, then on media creators and so on. And that was in sync with the, with the customer journey, but um, that was the main axis of, of uh, stories in that uh, story map. Um, there were stories around that as well. As I said before, that's from user story mapping, and you get a very cool effect if you uh, plan or design a product like that, because you, it will lead to very customer-centric sprint goals. Not like by very non-mature scrum teams that, okay, the product owner said, this is prior one, two, three, I will copy that to our sprint backlog. Oh, let's cool, let's reverse engineer some kind of sprint goal. Can we use and and or in our sprint goal? And that leads to very fantastic business-centric sprint goals. Like if visitors have to be able in four weeks to, to do that and that, 
in two weeks, when our sprint ends, they have to be able to do things like ABC. And that helped us to build really MV real MVPs. That's uh, from user story mapping as well. And I think um, Jeff Patton copied it from Henry Kneeberg. Uh, he invented it at Spotify. And this type of MVP, like, does it fill, fulfill the user's needs? Are exhibitors able to populate their booths with a solution that's a, a, which is a three, not a five? It's not full blown, but it's um, good enough for now for them to populate their booths. And that was a very cool tactic to not to build one part of the product uh, gold plated and the other one is just uh, very poor and have the same level in all parts of the product. The second pattern is three amigos. Um, we didn't call it like that. Nobody said, hey, let's have a three amigo session. Or, uh, we called it something like, hey, let, let's discuss this, this and that capability or something like this. Nobody said three amigos. Um, how do we find out how to provide these capabilities? And that was the, the key for finding that out, discovering solutions was this three amigo concept. Um, Three Amigo is a term called by Goiko Ajit in space specification by example. Um, this book and the concept is mostly focused on testing, uh, bringing together a tester, a business, business people and uh, an engineer to create good acceptance tests. But it's similar to the product trial described by Theresa Torres in Continuous Discovery Habits, bringing together a product guy um, someone from engineering and a designer. Um, and the idea behind it is to bring together the primary perspectives that are necessary to define or to discover uh, valuable solutions. Let's have a look at these risks. These are the three ones we were able to control. And the first one, the viability risk, is uh, addressed by the product owner or product manager. And disclaimer, if you try something like that, you need a real product owner or real product manager, not an agile project, a project manager, because these people have to think in ideas and solutions and not just doing stakeholder management or backlog administration. That should be a real CEO of the product. And um, in our case, this, this uh, product owner noted down bullet points for this capability. Hey, how could that look like? Um, how can we build this thing, um, build that value for the customer? Um, most of the time together with some very, very lo-fi uh, sketches of, hey, that could look something like, like something like that. And he did some research. Um, how do others do that? There were no that much um, virtual fairs out there at the moment. How do others do that? How do other industries do that, solve that problem and bring that uh, value to the customers? Is there an SAS service um, to make our life easier or, this, or something like that? And the product owner has to, this, uh, to, to organize delivery as well. Um, the, via, the usability risk is covered by the designer. Um, and it's a big challenge for designers too, because designers, from my experience, tend to make things, designs complete. Hey, there is an awful blank space in the upper right corner. Let's uh, add a login or profile button here. No, 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 don't do that. We are focusing on other things now, and we don't want to um, suggest things to the client we have to uh, call back um, later. Building designs incrementally is a hard job for a designer too, as it is for software engineers. Um, that was some kind of um, trap. All these events and uh, articles um, had different languages and our designer thought, hey, it would be a cool, cool idea, cool user experience just to visualize uh, the language by using a flag. Okay, and what's, what's the correct flag for English? Uh, the Union Jack, Stars and Stripes, uh, Canada, uh, South Africa, Australia. And 
so a concept that looked very cool for, from a usability um, or a design perspective in the end was not a cool idea. We just uh, changed the flags and used abbreviations. And so the design evolved from sketches to lo-fi uh, designs to uh, more high fidelity designs. And then the question arised, are we able to build within that short time period something like this Google Maps style starship oriented um, uh, hall plans, which leads to feasibility and that's addressed by the developer. Not all developers like that kind of tasks because there are no user stories yet and um, there are no specifications yet. And the, the goal is to find a very, very small solution for the problems or the jobs you try to address. Um, in the order, make it work, make it fast, make it scale, and not building at the first time something which is fast and scalable. Do we need a spike or something like that are questions that are uh, addressed on a regular basis at this time. To spread the word with the rest of the team, we use something like feature kickoffs, and the uh, picture is also inspired by, um, by Jeff Patton. Um, and we had uh, a discussion like that together with our client, and they said, hey, that looks cool, but uh, you will add the um, the release process in, within the next two uh, weeks. Release process? What kind of release process? Yeah, we need some kind of release process. I'm sure we told you that because otherwise uh, the uh, exhibitors will just add old games to have much buzz on the platform and we have to filter them out. And the last one was early feedback to tackle all that risks. The client just spread it, all these informations throughout the community. Hey, that uh, the, the fairground will look similar to that. What's your feedback? And the interesting thing was one of a, a Spanish blogger or YouTuber just read some of these few informations and described how the, the fairground would work to his local community in Spanish. And that was a cool effect because we, t we told them the concepts so he was able to, to um, um, translate it and explain it to his local community. They made polls, something like that. How would uh, the small booths look like, should look like, like that on the upper side or uh, the other one. The community had a very clear word for use, please use the upper one, that looks cooler, otherwise these small booths will just disappear. That was the feedback of the um, exhibitors that booked that small booths as well, hey, we'll just disappear. The problem was, feasibility risk, this one was much harder to build because these are, um, these are six times bigger than that and, and so on and so on. And they, um, described every step, uh, gave early tutorials, user onboarding, hey, that would look like that, and would work like that. And the interesting th thing is, some of you m might remember these, um, these social media posts when the, the booth um, is completed at an in-person conference. Hey, we are, still, we, we are already here, our booth is complete, we are very looking forward to, to tomorrow's hmm, XYZ conf, please visit us at our booth at uh, Hall, blah, blah, blah. And the exhibitors did something similar with their digital booths. They, had they took, took selfies of their uh, digital booths. Hey, we will be there, uh, just visit our booth in theme world XYZ. The community, uh, community provided, on one hand, valuable feedback, and on the other hand, um, motivating feedback. Something like, hey, that looks cool, you're on the right track, uh, we want to visit that fair, uh, um, very looking forward to it. And one of the YouTubers from this community, normally, in his uh, uh, YouTube series, he uh, just places boxes of board games in front of him and unpacks them and discusses the games. 
And at uh, the year tw 2020, he just used the platform and uh, posted links to the actual games in um, the chat of his YouTube channel. Did it work? Um, that's a normal in-person conference or a fair. Um, it looked similar to that in the virtual version. Um, the client, our client, uh, calculated that we had around 150,000 visitors on the platform during the four days. That was the main view, um, a board game-like user experience through the platform um, with a topic-based virtual exhibition halls called Theme Worlds. That is one of the Theme World and uh, it's the detail view and you can see something like interaction patterns, something like um, highly active booth has started, started to glow to see, oh, there's a crowd over there, I have to visit that booth. You can, uh, could see which booth is, uh, did I already visit, uh, sponsors of that theme world and so on. And that's all for my, um, from me and now I'm happy to answer your questions.